Thank you for listening to Freedom Church Online. Please stay tuned for a powerful word from God. We would love to have you worship with us in person, Sundays at 1045 a.m. at 701 Harwood Road in Bedford. Until then, sit back and enjoy this word. Amen. I'm continuing in a series called Get Dressed. Now, I know that some of you thought last week was the close of the series, and I thank God for Pastor Casey who came and told y'all to strap up your shoes with purpose. She told you to strap up your shoes, and you know, I'm a little hood, so she was like, the definition of the word strap. I was like, yeah, I know what that is. And then she said, a leather band bendable. I was like, oh, that's not what I was thinking. That's not what I was thinking when I hear the word strap. That's not what I was thinking. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but Pastor Casey did a great job of talking about the shoes uh, of the gospel of peace. And then several people were like, oh, yeah, the series is over. And I was just like, they didn't even read the rest of the text. We still got three more pieces of armor to go. We're not going to stop. We ain't going to have you. This, the series is get dressed, not half naked. <laughs> the series is get dressed. It's not half naked. And so we're going to continue in putting on the armor of God today. And today I don't have a fancy title. I don't have anything fancy for you. Simply going to tell you, want to talk to you today about the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Shields are an important part of our society even today, more so in the day of Paul and the Roman day. Uh, we've talked about several pieces of the armor. Uh, we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about the shoes. We've talked about the belt of truth. And today we're going to move on to the shield of faith. As I thought about this, the events of last week came to my mind. Uh, the NFL talks often about protecting the shield. They talk often about protecting the shield. If you don't know what that means, there is a logo that looks like a shield that is worn on every official garment of the NFL. It, it, it is found on their website, it's found on their network, it's found on every jersey, on, on every a piece of apparel that is sold. There is what's called the shield. And, and what they talk about in the NFL is protecting the shield. And at all costs, the NFL and its owners will protect the shield. Even so much so that, that, that when times came about in our country where the NFL had an opportunity to speak up and talk about injustices, it did not do so for the sake of the people who were being harmed or endangered. It did not do so because there was things that were promoting inequality and injustice in the nation. The NFL did not speak up for that, but when the shield was in danger, when, when, when the money was affected, when, when people began to see that there was division that could cause harm to an entity that has raised billions of dollars because of its entertainment value, when the shield was in jeopardy, everybody stood up or rather kneeled down for the shield. They, they took a bow, they took a knee for the shield and the NFL's shield had to be protected at all costs. And I had to think about that and I told myself any shield that needs protecting is one that is insignificant and insufficient at best. Any, any shield that needs protection is one that is insignificant and insufficient at best. I promise you, I got Bible and I'm going to preach this message on faith to you. Just don't, don't leave me. Don't leave me. The shield should be a means, watch this, of protecting and not needing protection itself. The, the shield should be a means of protecting one and not the one protecting the shield. It's backwards when I have to protect the shield. Parenthetically, that's why I'm learning not to defend my God. He, he doesn't need my defense. He, he doesn't need my arguments. Now, the Bible says be ready to give a defense for the hope that lives in you. You ought to be able to defend your faith, but you don't have to defend God. He's perfectly okay with defending himself. I, I don't have to defend my God. He's big enough, strong enough, and powerful enough to take care of himself. The God I serve is not in need of my protection. He doesn't need my protest nor my vote in order to be God. Makes some people angry today, but it's okay. He does, however, desire my obedience so that he can accomplish through me what he planned to do on the earth. 
God, God, God doesn't need my protection, but he does desire my obedience. And as we get to this place of the shield in Ephesians chapter number 6, verse 16 continues in our narrative. And it says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Uh, above all, taking the shield of faith. Paul switches the verbs here. When you go back and you read, if you pay attention in your Bible, when he, when he first starts, he says, having put on the belt of truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, having shoes shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he says, above all, taking the shield. See, see, there are certain things that are essential when you get dressed. There are certain things that are accessories. That now Paul is not just teaching us about getting covered. He's teaching us how to live stylishly according to kingdom living. He, he's teaching you how to accessorize. Having means this should be something that you always have as a part of your character, as a part of who you are. Truth is a part of your character. You, you, you ought not have to take up truth. You know, I lie on Wednesdays, but I take it up on Saturdays. He says righteousness should be who you are, that, that, that you are to have a righteous life, that, that the gospel, watch this, once it comes into your life and you receive it, becomes who you are. Like, I just am a, a, a saved, sanctified saint of, of Jesus Christ. I just believe that, and it's a part of who I am. But now he says there are some tools that you need to take with you because the enemy's going to come after you. I'm going to say that again. Now he's telling you there are some tools, some accessories to getting dressed that you need to take with you because the enemy is going to come after you. These next three items, faith, salvation, and the word of God are tools that we need to have ready when the enemy brings about an attack. Interestingly, though, when looking at the configuration of the army, armor, God has made no provisions for the backside of the believer. Stick with me. That there is no provision for the backside of the believer. Which means when troubles, trials, and tribulations come, you're not supposed to run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you are not called to back down. You are not called to run away. You will get shot with an arrow in the back and die because God has made no provision for you to turn around and run away. You are to face your enemy. You, you, you are to go head to head, toe to toe with the one who is coming against you. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us that God never called you to run from your enemy. When a believer gets dressed, we get dressed for fight, not flight. We, we, we get dressed to fight. We are to fight the enemy. We are in a war. We do not retreat. We do not run. We resist. We resist the enemy. Where do I find that? James chapter 4 verse 7 gives us a formula for life. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. People are saying, the devil is always on my tail. That's because you were supposed to turn around. Y'all oh, missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Devil's always chasing me. Turn around. He, he, he can tell you that lie from behind. Yeah, yeah. But when you look him in the face, yeah. having truth, yeah, yeah. Yes. having righteousness, yeah. having the good news, yeah, yeah. the Bible says resist him. And he has to run. He'll flee. If you find yourself consistently looking behind you and the devil is following you, you are going in the wrong direction. I'm not saying that if you're going in the right direction that you won't have trouble. No, but you should be coming face to face with the devil. He shouldn't be running behind you. Yeah. I should meet him on the road to where I'm going. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll show you that in the text in just a second. Watch this. The, the Bible says in James 4, 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says the same thing. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you ever watch National Geographic? It's the lion who approaches the sick, the lonely, 
or the aged. And here's what he does. He waits till they're alone. And what he does is he prowls. When they're running, watch this, he attacks them from behind. He, he, I oftentimes wonder what's going on with the lion. The lion can go headstrong with a gazelle. But the lion says, let him start running. Because when they get behind, I'll bite him in his back and pull him down. And the reality is when you run away from the enemy, he's waiting, he's been prowling, he's been waiting, and you're running, and what he does is he chases behind you, grabs your back, and pulls you down. This is why you're not making progress. Bible says in this text, resist him. Steadfast in the faith. We're talking about the shield of faith today. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Peter is writing to a people who are being persecuted for their faith. Matter of fact, some believe that this is the time where Nero is actually persecuting the Christians. And Peter is actually telling the Christians, he says, hey, there are brothers all over the world, all over the empire who are suffering. But here's what you have to do. You have to resist the enemy. Don't run from him. They, they would oftentimes in those days call the people who ran from persecution, they would call them the lapsed. They would say that they lapsed in their faith because at some point they ran away from the persecution, not resisting it, not standing up to it. They called them the lapsed. And so what Peter is saying is resist the enemy, resist him in, in, in the unfair treatment, resist him in the persecution, resist him. Resist is a word that is translated to be hostile towards. The one thing that we have to remind ourselves of is that the enemy is not our friend. He, he is not a friendly opponent on a football field or a basketball field. You're not going to kneel down at the end of the game and pray with him. Yeah. Good game, dog. Y'all act like y'all didn't see that. You, you watch the game, and at the end of the game, they, they kneel down together, and you got teams with the white jersey on and teams with the blue jersey, and they praying together at the end of the game. Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Satan. Satan. Go Satan. That's how y'all act. Bible says resist him. That means I have to have a hostility toward him. When the Bible describes him in this particular passage, it says that he has wiles and schemes, which means they may not just show up for you to say, I'm bowing down to Satan. He was bold with Jesus, asked him to bow down. He's not that bold with you. He, he comes along with schemes of division, schemes of and lies of insecurity, shame, guilt, these schemes that he's doing, these schemes that he's plotting with, here's what he's doing. He's coming up against you and trying to get you to think, hey, 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 just come over here. It's a friendly game. of, And y'all aren't hostile toward these lies he's telling. We, we aren't hostile toward the things that he's bringing about as charges. As Christians, we cannot be passive or fearful when it comes to the attack of the enemy. God is calling you to be assertive and aggressive when it comes to your spiritual defense. And once you've secured your freedom, it is your job to go out and help somebody else obtain theirs. Today I want to use the shield of faith, as Paul did, to show you how we resist the enemy. To show you what it should do to something on the inside of you. When you leave here, I pray that you're motivated. I pray that when you talk, have you ever heard somebody talk about uh, demonic warfare or spiritual warfare or the devil? And they say, hey, don't talk about the devil. That means he's going to come out and start attacking you because you're talking about him. And we talk about the enemy like he's a winner. When the Bible describes him as an eternal loser, everything he attempts, he loses. Even when he wins, he loses. He crucified Jesus not knowing that that was his defeat. That the reality is we've got to stop being afraid of the enemy and have faith in our God. So instead of just breaking down faith and talking about what it is and giving you definitions, I want to show you a moment in the scripture when Jesus calls his disciples to faith. I want you to see some of their failures that's found in some of the things that we do. I want you to see some of the things that God is calling us to that would actually bless your life. And so I got three, uh, four things that I want to share with you from Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. If you get there, drop down to verse 22. And if you're taking notes, this is the first note that you have. The shield, and we're talking about the shield as faith. The shield is faith. The shield gives me courage. The shield gives me courage. That's your first point. Write that down. The shield gives me courage. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 26, the Bible says, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. Read it again. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. While he sent the, the multitudes away, 
And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Let me give you some context so you can respect the content. Here's the reality. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. If you, if you at all have been a Sunday school valedictorian or a hermeneutical scholar, you understand that the feeding of the 5,000 is one of the greatest miracles that we read about. Jesus takes loaves and fish from a little boy's lunch, and his mama probably was hot. You gave your lunch to who? I don't care who that preacher is. He can't eat before we do. She missed the point. What happens is the little boy gives his lunch to Jesus. Jesus then blesses it and breaks it. Whole nother sermon. Passes it out. And they got leftovers. Immediately after this, the Bible says, they collect 12 baskets full of leftovers. Immediately after this, Jesus says, hey, y'all, get in the boat and leave. Here's why. They had all that leftovers. The people were going to attack them. No, I'm just kidding. That's not the <laughs> he, he tells them to leave. I think Jesus is getting ready to show them something. We'll see it here in the text. Immediately, he tells them to get into the boat. Jesus has just performed a great miracle. And so to the disciples, obedience produces prosperity. Watch the text now. That he says, sit them down in groups of 50. I'm talking about the feeding of the 5,000. You're going to have to go back and read it. Trust me for the moment, but don't trust me after this. Go back and read it. Sit them down in groups of 50. He blesses the bread. He breaks it. He blesses the fish. He breaks it. They pass it out. They have leftovers. He says, pass it out. There were five loaves. Now, loaves aren't like your Winco loaves. We're talking about like pieces of bread, like little bread. He got five pieces of bread. I mean, five fish and two loaves. Five fish, two loaves, two loaves, five fish. I don't know. I always get confused. It was seven or something. I know how to add. <laughs> the, the point is, they're passing out this little bit of food that was a boy's lunch for 15 to 20,000 people. Because he fed the 5,000, but that was just the record of men not including women, of children, women and children. And so the disciples obey what God says. And as a result of obedience, they receive prosperity. See, obedience produces prosperity sometimes. But in this situation, Jesus says, immediately he tells the disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. And as they go to the other side, something strange happens. There in the boat, Jesus goes away to pray, as he often does, which is some of the problem with me. I, I'm, I'm always doing the work of God, but never talking to God. I'm just talking about me. I'm not talking about you. Sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm so busy doing something for the Lord that I don't take time to just get in communion with the Lord. Jesus shows us a model. He gets away and he says, after all of this ministry, I just got to take a week off. I got to take some time off. I got to take a, a moment and just pray. He got to be refilled from what he poured out. The Bible says when evening comes, he's alone there. But the boat that he sent the disciples in, that he told them. Now, this is what we believe is that this is God in the flesh. This is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Fully God, fully man. That means he's omniscient, which means he's all-knowing. He, he sends them in the boat across the water, but now the boat is being tossed by waves. Jesus goes to a place of peace while the disciples go into a place of pain. Y'all missed it. Sometimes the all-knowing, all-seeing God sends you head first into a storm. You, you got to understand that obedience does not always produce what you love. More fish sandwiches. We're waiting for the fish sandwich miracle when the Lord is saying, I got a storm lesson in your life coming. It's tight, but it's right. The reality is sometimes we think that obedience always produces what's pleasurable when sometimes obedience sends me into a problem. That obedience sends me into opposition. That sometimes the opportunity that I'm about to face is an opportunity for God to show off his power through my opposition. But the one thing we have to remember is it was the word of God that sent them there. And the word of God produces faith. Or it's supposed to. Okay. Hebrews 10 and 17 says, and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If Jesus told him to go, the Bible says in John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Drop down to verse 14. And the word became flesh. John is teaching us that Jesus is the incarnate or the word of God in the flesh. 
So that when Jesus speaks, he is God. He's the word of God. The word of God told them to go across the sea. If the word sent them, the word should have produced faith in them. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? The shield of faith, right? And I'm saying that the, fa- the shield produces courage. The shield gives me courage. He sends them into a storm, but I don't think he sent them without courage. Yeah. He sent them with his word. Here's the problem. Many of us, when we find ourselves discouraged, is because we went somewhere without a word from God. That when I find myself in a storm and not afraid, because there are times when I'm afraid even though I still believe God. That's just not human to say that you're not going to be afraid even when you trust God. I'm saying when I'm discouraged sometimes, it's because I've gone somewhere without a word from God. That God didn't give me the word to go to that place. God didn't tell me where to go. Uh, God didn't tell me to do that. And this is why I have to be careful throwing out the words the Lord told me to. You know the super saved people in here. When you got dressed this morning, girl, that's a nice jacket you got on. You know the Lord told me to wear this today. (laughs) Super saints. The super saints, you know. You know the super saints. That, That everything that they did, the Lord told them to do it, you know. He, he, he told me to tie my shoes differently today, and you wouldn't believe what happened. A pit bull came, and when the pit bull came, because I tied my shoes differently, the old way, I'm believing, I'm believing that my shoe would have fallen off, and that pit bull would have caught me, but thanks be to God. Hey. You know, when somebody do that, you feel it, don't you? Don't you feel it? Baby? You better be careful you throw your back out. <laughs> That the, that the super saints feel that they, they always say, and I'm not saying that the Lord does not speak. I believe that God speaks, but you better be careful about throwing out that the Lord told you. You better be sure, because when the storm comes, it's the same word you claimed is the same word that's supposed to give you courage. The same word that you said sent me is the same word that's supposed to sustain you. I got too many people saying, the Lord told me to marry her. But when the storm comes, the Lord told you to leave? Did the Lord sign a short-term contract on your marriage? The Lord told me to take the job. And when your boss disagrees with you, now the Lord is telling you to quit? Lowercase L, lowercase L. The Lord sure is fickle. Lowercase L, Jamal, lowercase L. Do not put that on YouTube and tell somebody telling me that Yahweh is fickle. Yahweh knows all. Yahweh sees all. And even when he sends me into the storm, he sustains me in said storm. If it was God that told you to take the job, marry the person, move to that town, choose that career, preach the gospel, then it'll be God that'll give you the faith and courage to deal with the difficulties of the same situation. Don't you know I want to quit this thing so many days? No, like, that's not hyperbole. I want to quit. Like, for real, for real. Like, tomorrow, I want to quit. I wanted to quit yesterday. But the Lord told me. And so when opposition comes and when he tries to discourage me and in the middle of the storm tell me that I'm not doing a good job, telling me that I'm not called to it, it's the word of the Lord that sustains me through my pain. I think I'm talking to somebody who's about to give up. I think I'm talking to somebody who's ready to throw in the towel. I think I'm talking to somebody who's trying to figure out whether they continue or whether they quit. What did the Lord say? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24 says, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. The fact that God promises to handle your most difficult of situations should be encouragement for your discouragement. And the word encourage literally means to place courage in. That, That what faith does is it places courage in you. The shield gives me courage. I now know that what's coming after me can't destroy me, so I'll go and I'll face the enemy because I've got the faith that came from the word of God that is going to sustain me even in my situation. I need you to get this. Understanding that God can take care of your situation gives you knowledge. Believing that God will take care of your situation gives you courage. Say that again. Y'all, y'all, y'all missed that. 
understanding that God can handle your situation gives you knowledge. There are a lot of people who are running around with head knowledge of God and repeatable head knowledge at that. You tweet it out all the time. I love y'all when you tweet. You tweet your, your, your good lines and those little, you know, the little 138 characters. You know how to do it in 138. Like, you're an expert. And it's deep. And people are like, 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 share, 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 share. <laughs> and here's where we are. We understand what God can do. It's our knowledge. But as soon as we hit send, we cry. As soon as we hit send, we doubt. As soon as we hit send, we retreat. Because believing says he will, and it gives us courage. The shield gives me courage, but not only that, the shield gives me covering. The, the Roman soldier's shield was about four feet tall and about three feet wide. It was humongous. It could cover a crouching soldier in his entirety. And when they would get together, they would literally get together. If y'all ever seen the 300? Y'all seen the 300? When Leonidas tells them they got to get together and they, they create a, a, a the, line, the, line, the line in there of the movie, I don't know it perfectly, but, but when they say, uh, he says, we will send a million arrows that will block out the sun. And they say, and so we will fight in the shade. Uh, that feel good, don't it? That feel good, don't it? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if I'd have been that dude. I'd be like, a million arrows? Well, how are we going to fight that? But that line sounds good. We will fight in the shade. I need some fight in the shade people with me. But, but they literally, they get together and they crouch under the, 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 the shields. And the shields provide them with two things. It provides them with cover while the darts are coming. We'll go see that in the scripture. And it gives them cover as they advance. We saw that in the scripture already. Let's start with advancing. They could get together, lock arms and lock shields, and they can knock over anything. Nothing can stop them because the shield covers them from being attacked by the enemy. This is why the Bible tells you to resist. Don't resist in your own beliefs. Don't resist in your own power. Don't resi resist with the shield of faith. You, you can advance. Here's the problem though. Sometimes we're trying to advance by ourselves. We need community. This is why I challenge you to be in life groups. Because there are things that you're going through in your life, and you do believe God's going to do something, but the arrow hits you from the side. And had I been there telling Xander, come here, Xander. Had I been there telling Xander, Xander, this is what I'm going through. I need you to be praying for me. And you hold your shield up. Jamal, come up here for a second. And I tell Jamal, Jamal, this is what I'm dealing with. Hold up your shield. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord has raised up a standard against it. And when he starts shooting his fiery darts and his advancing arrows, here's what we do. We're going to take one step off the stage. Y'all ready? One, two, three, go. We can advance. We can move forward together. And the devil can't stop me because one will put a thousand to flight, two, ten thousand to flight. I think sometimes we think that's just demons. What if it's the arrows of the enemy? What if just one, one shield can take a thousand arrows, but two can take ten thousand arrows, and three can take a hundred thousand arrows? And if all of us got together in this room, the enemy don't have enough arrows to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. The shield gives me covering. Where do we find that in the narrative? With Jesus, the Bible says now in the fourth watch of the night, verse 25 and 22, 27, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. The Bible says that's so, narrow, so, so normal. Like Jesus just shows that he's walking on water. The Bible doesn't say, and amazingly, because the Bible knows what we forget. He has power and control over all creation. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it's a ghost, man. Y'all saw that new movie, right? That's that ghost from that movie, bro. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, be of good cheer. Look, look, look. It is I. Do not be afraid. J Jesus shows up while the disciples are in the middle of their struggle. And what it produces at first is more fear. Ooh, I'm talking to somebody. You're going through what you're going through, and the Lord shows up and tells you, tithe in the financial difficulty. Wow. 
and it creates more fear before it actually produces the faith that's necessary to get it done. You, you're going through your struggle of being alone and you want to get married and the Lord says, I'm going to need you to date no one for the next two years. Yeah. And it makes you afraid because you're asking yourself, what do I do next? You're, you're saying to yourself, I need to put the resume in for a better and a better paying job. And the Lord says, no, stay where you are. He shows up in the middle of your struggle, but it produces fear before it produces faith. They're afraid when they see him. Sometimes when you see God, it doesn't automatically produce for you some feeling of, of, of conquering and victory. Sometimes it makes you afraid because you don't recognize that as him. You don't recognize that it's him. And Jesus shows up in their struggle, and he's actually trying to do the same for you. And the good news is he's actually been watching them the whole time. Though he did go to pray, he actually has his eye on them because the same story in Mark chapter 648 gives us a detail that I, I saw when I was studying that blessed me. Look at Mark 648. It says, then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch, about 3, three to 6 a.m. of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. He was trying to get ahead of what was destroying them. Yeah, yeah. Bible says he saw them straining. Can, can I talk to somebody in the room that needs to hear this today? You walked in here thinking nobody cares. You walked in here thinking nobody, no, nobody loves you. Here's the reality. The Lord says to you today, I see you. I've been watching you strain against the road. I've been watching you strain against the water. I've been watching you fight against the wind. I'm about to show up. And I need somebody who's been fighting against the wind, who's been fighting in this storm to understand the Lord has been watching you. The Lord sees you and he's about to show up. I know there are times when you feel like no one sees your struggle. Nobody sees you trying. Nobody sees your progress. But the good news is today, somebody say he sees you. And if you believe he sees you, that should lead you to believe that you're covered. The same, the same God who sees my problem will show up in my problem with a solution for my problem. Yeah, yeah. Say it again. The same God who sees my problem will show up in my problem with a solution for my problem. And you've got to believe that he's got you covered. When Jesus shows up, he covers them with what he says. A simple phrase, watch, it is I. One translation says, I am here. What, what, what some people say that that translation is, is I am is here. See, that's Freedom Church, because we did a series earlier this year called He Is, I Am. And everything I need him to be, that's what he shows up as. So if I'm in the middle of a storm, if he says, I am, is here, I need shelter from the storm. It's here. If I need provision, it's here. If I need healing, it's here. If I need mental stability, it's here. If I need boldness for witness, it's here. If I need to be strengthened in my suffering, it's here. He says, I am is here. You need to understand that you are covered by God. Uh, let me see if I can help you with this by shaming and embarrassing myself. Um. I, I go out to preach in the summertime. Y'all know I go to a lot of youth camps. Y'all know sometimes I'm absent. I'm MIA. Uh, and and y'all will say, oh, where's Pastor? Oh, he's preaching at a camp this week. He had to go out of town. And so what I do is I got smart. I pack preaching outfits that I take all summer. I preach in them the week. I wash them during the week. And I roll. Well, some of these camps, I mean, honestly, the culture of them, I preach the uh, same way. I'm always me. But I don't sweat as much. I don't work as hard. You know, something about y'all, y'all make me work hard. I ain't going to say it. <laughs> Mess with you. I, I don't I don't work as much, so I don't sweat as much. And so what happens is I still sweat. Don't get me wrong, I still sweat. But I don't sweat as much. Now if you notice, I always have on a shirt and something over my shirt when I preach. I'm gonna have a jacket on, I'm gonna have a sweater. Normally it's a sweater, get dressed serious, so I gotta wear a jacket. You know, I gotta show y'all that your boy can get dressed, okay? So what happens is I oftentimes will go to these summer camps and I just rock a shirt with an undershirt under it. And so what I did was I packed up my preaching outfits. I rode through the summer. Everything was cool. I get to my last week of preaching, but it was a group that was going to make me preach a little harder than I've been preaching all summer. And I get up there with my summer preaching outfit that I don't sweat that much in, but I'm sweating. I mean, I'm sweating. And it's one of them old school churches. You know, the fans are going, but ain't no air moving. <laughs> And so I'm in there preaching, and I'm sweating. I mean, I'm sweating. And I got on my shirt, and I happen to have on one of my lighter shirts that, you know, when you sweat through it, it starts sticking to me, but you can see straight through it. 
it, it was a moment where I'm up there and I'm preaching and I'm sweating because the environment that I was in before has changed and I didn't have proper coverage. And so what happens is I'm standing in front of these people, preaching my heart out, doing what I do, not changing what I've done, but actually in a new environment, and I'm exposed. I mean, I mean, no, embarrassingly exposed. I wouldn't look at myself in the bathroom. I said, oh, my God. What? Was I preaching like this? Oh, my God. And I was embarrassed. I mean, I sweated all the way through my shirt. I mean, like see-through wet t-shirt contest. Like, it was bad. But it's because the environment changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't think to up my coverage. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that the game had changed, yeah, yeah. but I kept my same coverage. Yeah. Can I tell you that when you were on the enemy side, you didn't have to sweat that much. There wasn't that much opposition. There wasn't that much of a fight. There wasn't too much coming up against you. Yeah, he affected you and made you feel depressed because he was trying to destroy you. But at the same time, when he thought you were going to turn around and face him, he pushed you forward a little bit. And so you felt the push, and you thought that was a little prosperity. You felt the push, and you thought that was progress. You felt the push, and you thought that was you moving forward. But when you turned around and you accepted Jesus Christ and his will and his way, he started to oppose you. And here's what happened. You put on the gospel. You put on the breastplate. You put on the belt. But you needed a shield to give you more coverage because the environment changed. The fight changed. And you needed more coverage. Don't find yourself exposed and uncovered fighting the enemy. You need a shield of faith that covers you. That shield says he's got your back he's taking care of it and you are not alone look at somebody tell him I'm covered I'm covered don't be like me I was exposed disciples needed a new level of faith when that environment changed on land with fish and bread no sweat in the water in the midst of a storm I needed faith the shield gives me covering. Thirdly, the shield gives me confidence. The shield gives me confidence. P Peter hears the word of God and does what Peter does. I think Peter doesn't necessarily get bold as much as he shows off for the other disciples, I want to do something crazy. But it was this word that even ignited his impulsiveness. Watch this. Matthew 14, 28 and 29 says, and Peter answered him and said, okay. It's RWV. Robert White version. Okay, okay, okay. If that's you, I'm going to get out on this water. You tell me to come. I want to hear you say it. Because what Peter knew was that the Lord wouldn't call him out and let him drown. Or I thought he knew that. We'll talk about that in a second. So Peter is thinking, if it's a ghost, the ghost will call me out and I'll drown. I think what Peter thought was the Lord going to be like, Peter, don't be crazy. Stay in the boat, my son. Be safe. But the Lord says, come. Now something in Peter said, wait a minute. That's his voice. And I just said if he wanted me to come that I should go if he called me, now I'm gonna look like I'm going back on my word in front of my boys and I'll be disobedient to the Lord. I guess I'll just step out. And so he steps out. And when he steps out, watch the Bible says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come on to you in the water. And he, so he said, come, just one word. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus, I want you to write this down. Until you know who you are in your Savior, you will remain where you are in your situation. I told you Peter's intentions and his impulsion are, are not exactly what I want you to mimic. But I do want you to mimic his obedience. That when the Lord says come, what he does is, he says, if you're mine, I got you. 
If you're mine, I'm going to take care of you. If you're mine, I won't let you drown. And so what happens then is, if you know who you are in your Savior, you, until you know who you are in your Savior, you will remain where you are in your situation. Some of us are stuck because we won't obey the come. And so we stay in a boat struggling to get across. And here's the Lord standing in front of the boat. Remember, the Bible says that he would pass them by. And they say, here's this ghost. Here's the Lord standing in front of them saying, just come to me. Like, get out the boat. And they're saying, imagine everybody else. No, nah, the boat is safe. Jesus was behind them and is now ahead of them, but the boat is safe. There's sometimes in our lives, watch this. The Lord has gone before us, and he's telling us to step out into something new, to trust him, to go to another level. And here's what we're doing. We're staying in the boat that we're comfortable with and saying to the Lord, but God, you go there. I'm, I'm still, I got my eyes on you. I'm still coming to church. Wow. Yeah. Disobedient, but I'm still here. I'm still, I'm still going to serve. I mean, I will be at the door. High five. Welcome to freedom. Welcome to freedom. Welcome to freedom. We love you. Have a great week. In the boat, struggling. Monday through Saturday. Strain. I was wondering why some of y'all's arms have been so buffed. You've been struggling. Struggling. And Peter receives this confidence from the word of God because what I want you to do, and, and don't do what Peter did. Don't, don't do it on his impulsion, but, but do it on the obedience. That you got to understand that you have confidence in God's credit and not your ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do I mean by that? that? That God has never failed you yet, and he won't fail you ever. And so Peter has to recognize that this is the same guy who told me to break bread and fish and fed 5,000 people. This is the same guy that told me to go fishing for my taxes, and in the first fish that I found was enough money for my taxes and his. This is the same dude that I brought to my house when my mother-in-law was sick, and he healed her, and she gets up, and she starts serving us. This is the same guy that I watched go to a, a, a funeral in Maine, touch a boy, and he gets out of a casket. Am I going to believe what he said? This is the same God. Who, is the yesterday, who, who promised you from yesterday, today, and forevermore. Are you going to believe what he said? I'll never forget. I was a couple of years ago. I was at a conference. I'm closing. I was at a conference. I was at a conference, and I was uh, in Cleveland. I was in Cleveland. I wanted to give an offering uh, from the church, from our church, to this church that I was in Cleveland at this conference from. And they said, hey, you want to make an offering? Yes, I want to do this offering. So they said, hey, what do you want? how do you want to do it? I said, I want to use the card. I want to use the card. So I go out to the lobby. I want to use my card. On, I guess they had a square pay or something like that. So they're swiping my card, and it's the card. It has Freedom Church on it. Robert White is in small. Freedom Church is big. It says Freedom Church. I swipe the card. They say it was denied. Now, first thing right through my head is, we got some impropriety in the church. I'm about to come home and cut some heads. Uh, this is embarrassing, and, and it's frustrating, and, and I got to figure out what's happening. So, I log in to the church account. What I found there was, I was too impulsive. No need for forgiveness or fighting. The money's all there. I say, no, something's wrong. The money's there. Swipe it again. Swipe it again. Deny. Now I'm getting mad. I say, y'all got a printer? I'm going to print out the statement and show it to them. I got the money. I go back again. I say, swipe it. They swipe it. It says, decline. By this point, I'm looking up to heaven. I'm saying, Lord, what's happening? I said, I felt like you said, yeah, yeah. so into this place. But then I'm thinking, maybe something wrong. I start justifying. Maybe he's sleeping with the women in the church. Maybe the Lord is trying to stop me from giving to this dude. Now, all of a sudden, my obedience is predicated. So, so what happens is, I'm trying to stop being honest. Can I be real? So I'm thinking, yeah, hey man, something must be wrong. The Lord is blocking the transaction. I can see that the money is there. I didn't have to call home and fire nobody. So everything is there. Had it been my card, I would have walked away humbly and said, okay. Well. Because I know what I, I'm limited to. But it wasn't my card. This wasn't my account. My name was written on it, but it wasn't my account. I had access to it, but it wasn't my account. It was his. 
You, you do know that when you give, yeah. that's not my money. It's not freedom's money, it's his. Yeah. So, so when I knew what he had in his account, ending in 5473, no, I'm just kidding, that ain't the numbers, y'all like, <laughs> I'm a hacker, I'm gonna figure it out. When I knew that he had in the account, it drove me to the place where I said, God, if you told me that this is what I'm supposed to do, I'm not putting my confidence in me nor their system. It's got to be in you. Did you say it? I go back and I say, run it one more time. I prayed about this. The Lord told me that I'm supposed to give this. Your pastor, I guess, is if he's doing something foul, it's going to be between him and the Lord. But this ain't going to be on me. The Lord told me to do it. Run it one more time. He ran it. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what was happening, sir. It went straight through. The point I'm trying to make in this is the confidence that I had when he told me what to do was not in my ability nor my account. It was in his credit. My confidence was in what he had. My confidence was in what he could do. My confidence was in what he could produce. And in your life, you've got to stop thinking about your limitations. You've got to stop thinking about what you can't do. You've got to stop thinking about where you failed. You've got to stop making excuses about what others didn't do or what they might do with what God has called you to and stand on his word and say, God, I'll be obedient because the shield gives me confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Last but not least, the shield gives me correction. Peter steps out, we say presumably on faith. I'm saying today on impulse. And when you step out on impulse, God doesn't just throw you away. He uses that an opportunity to correct you so that you can have faith. Matthew 14, 31 through 33 says, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him, said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Where, where was your confidence? And, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly you are the son of God. I'm done, but I need to get you to understand that the shield gives me correction. I don't want to yell at this point, but I want to talk to you like you were across my, my kitchen table. And you are ashamed of some of the things that you've done. I need to tell you that faith doesn't mean you're perfect. Faith means you're trusting. And for some of you, you feel that because you put your head down and stopped walking on the water and you started to sink, that you deserve to drown. The text says that immediately, just as immediately as he sent them into the water, immediately he stretches out his hand. Somebody in here right now, you're thinking you deserve to sink. You're right. You're thinking you deserve to drown. You're right. But here's the reality. God's outstretched hand does not desire for you to sink. He doesn't desire for you to drown. The shield produces correction. What do I mean? He, he literally says every mistake that you make, here's what faith says. Faith doesn't say I'll never mess up. Faith says, I'll try not to mess up that way ever again. The Bible records that David is a man after God's own heart. It's funny because this is the same guy who took a census when God told him not to. He's the same guy who got us a kill. Like, like by carrying the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. If you don't know what that story is, like God had a specific way to carry the Ark of the Covenant, which represents his presence. One of his guys who's just following his instructions touches the Ark when he's not supposed to, and he dies. David got him killed. He's responsible for that death. David, y'all know this story. The same one who got on that rooftop when he should have been in battle and took another man's wife. The Bible has the nerve to call him a man after God's own heart. Years ago, God showed me this. And this is a word for somebody in here today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you minister this to somebody. The word for you today is that David is not a man after God's own heart because he didn't make mistakes. But it's because we only read about one Bathsheba. We only read about one Uzzah. 
We only read about one census. That David says, I might have made that mistake, but according to the grace of God, and I believe that his way is best, as best as I can live in him, I'm not going back to that one again. And for somebody who's in here right now, who's feeling like I can never be like David, sure you can. Matter of fact, if David was a man after God's own heart, raise your hand if you killed a man. Did you steal another man's wife or husband? Some of you keep your hands down. <laughs> Just joking. My point is, David wasn't perfect. He just loved God enough to look at him and say, I was wrong, God. You were right. The shield provides correction. And here's what happens. When you decide that the shield is there to give you correction. I went into battle and I got hit in the arm. Oh my God, nope, the shield gives me correction. It lets me go back again and finish what he started. There's some people in here today, two types of people that I feel the Holy Spirit is telling me to say. One, you're in here today and you come and you said, hey, look, I'm going to try this church thing. And they've been telling me to come and, you know, this dude's going to tell some jokes and whatever. But, but you, you, you feel like God could never accept you. Like, not me. In that instance, like right now, God is saying to you, I want you. Like, I, I want you. I want you to take on the shield of faith. Let me correct all the things that have been done wrong, that you've done wrong. Let, let me move you on to a new life. You can receive Jesus Christ today, and he'll be your Lord and your Savior. That's the first person. Second person. You hear me clear. You've been stuck in some weird place of self-pity, shame, and guilt over who you've been, where you've been, what you did. Because you so-called Christian, you, you, you thought you were saved, and you are. You just need to do like David and repent and say, God, I'm back. You were right. I was wrong, but I'm back. I'm back. And the same David who after Uzzah died from touching the ark danced in the streets because he was able to recover God's presence. He went mourn for three months. I don't know how long you've been gone. But you've done your mourning. Weeping may endure for a night. But it's morning time now. Your mourning is over. It's time to celebrate. It's time to dance. It's time to receive the forgiveness of the Lord. It's time for you to come home. That's, that's my message for you today. Allow the shield to give you courage, covering, confidence, and correction. Thanks for listening to this message. We hope you enjoyed it. You can also view a videotaped message on our app, My Freedom DFW, found in any app store. And remember, love free, Live free, be free.